here we go. Uh, Mars Hill Church in Seattle, Washington is a story that has inspired millions of words and stories and will continue to be studied for many years. I know I have uh, used uh, my experience with Mars Hill in a couple of my psychology classes as a professor. Uh, when looking at uh, the church retrospectively, it's hard to know when to start uh, or where to start in the history. There's a good case to be made to just go all the way back to the beginning, uh, at the founding. Uh, maybe you could start with the William Wallace Chronicles, where uh, Mark Driscoll uh, took on a uh, you know fake identity and had a lot of interesting things to say about marriage and family roles and women. One could easily trace elements of the decline to the eviction of Paul Petrie and Bit Meyer as elders in 2007, or one could begin closer to the demise when certain events led to the church closing. Today, though, I want to start with more recent events because I have the privilege of talking to Sutton Turner and Dave Bruscus, two of the three executive elders, along with Mark Driscoll, during the last years of Mars Hill's existence. And I, I want to thank these men for taking time today and would like to uh, start by asking them to uh, tell us what they're doing now and what their roles were at Mars Hill Church. So whoever wants to go first. Thanks, Warren. Um, thanks for taking the opportunity to talk with Dave and I um, about Mars Hill and um, kind of go in depth um, since you um, walked alongside uh, us back in 2011, 12, 13, 14, um, and since. Um, I have uh, the privilege for the last two years to be uh, um, COO of a company called Vanderblumen, um, where we serve churches, all different denominations on helping uh, executive search and consulting. So what's great is, is I'm able to not be back in pastoring a church but being serving a church and lots of different churches, all different denominations. And so it's, it's able to use my business skills, um, but then again, serve the church. And so I'm very thankful for this opportunity that I currently have. Hey, Warren and Sutton. Thanks. Thanks, Warren. It's, it's uh, good to be with you today. I currently serve as the campus pastor at the Village Church in Fort Worth. And when I was with Mars Hill, I started out as a lead pastor, which if people aren't familiar with the Mars Hill uh, nomenclature, that would be the equivalent of a campus pastor at the first out-of-state uh, campus in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That would have been uh, July of 2009. And then about November of 2010, through the closure of Mars Hill, I served as an executive elder there. All right. All right, well, thanks uh, again. Uh, let's uh, just talk a little bit about um, th this uh, story, quite a story that it is, and you guys lived it. Um, I wanna start in 2013. Uh, that uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go back a little further than that, but I wanna start there. Uh, this, that was the year that Mars Hill came on my radar. Um, and I want to talk, I want to ask you about something that was happening behind the scenes that uh, may have really started the public slide of the church, if you will. In May uh, 2013, uh, Elder Dave Kraft submitted formal charges against Mark Driscoll. Uh, he submitted them according to a procedure that was set forth in your bylaws, but they didn't seem to go anywhere. Nothing really happened with those. Uh, from you guys' point of view, why weren't those charges, or why wasn't that letter taken seriously at that time? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, Warren, your first question to me was, what was my role at Mars Hill? So m uh, Dave Bruscus, myself, and Mark Driscoll were the three executive elders um, at Mars Hill during the time period. I served as uh, executive pastor so media, communications, finance, um, all of the executive pastors, facilities, development, all of those types of things um, reported up to me. Dave, all of the ministries and the lead pastors reported to Dave. And both he and I both reported to Mark Driscoll. 
um, not only were we what's called executive elders, but um, because we were executive elders, we were three of the board members that were uh, that were on the board of directors of the 501c3. Um, and so to answer your question about Dave Kraft, um, you know, he, so the May of 2013 charges um, were brought up with nine uh, uh, fellow elders that he said that he could bring forward um, during some type of investigation. Um, and what's interesting is, is it, if you look back at those uh, May um, 2013 charges, they're very, very similar um, to the charges um, that the Board of Elders in the late summer, early fall of 2014 uh, actually found um, of Mark, um, which was quick temper, it was three things, really quick tempered, uh, including harsh speech, arrogant is the second one, and then domineering in his leadership of elders and staff. And so, um, so that very similar, if you read through Dave's crafts to then what was produced um, basically a little over a year and a half later. Um, unfortunately, those charges that, like you were talking about, in that existing um, board, um, in that existing um, um, bylaws, there wasn't really any type of formal investigation that was called out, um, and, and, and which was corrected in 2014 with the formation of what's called the Board of Elders. Um, and we can get into that later. But um, at that point in time, um, there really wasn't any uh, direct process to handle uh, charges against uh, uh, a executive elder. Um, and so, you know, that's just my recollection uh, back in, in that time period. One of the things that I think was, was problematic with that, Warren, was uh, the chairman of our board at the time uh, really interpreted what was going on with Dave uh, Kraft and Mark as a personal dispute and, and really kind of handled it that way, kind of became a, a mediator between the two of them, uh, met with Dave regularly, talked with Dave, talked with Mark. And so rather than it being a, a formal objective process, it was more informal and relational. And so the, the, the problem with that was, uh, by all accounts, those two men were pretty good with each other. Dave wasn't bringing to the table personal disputes with Mark. He was bringing to get, he was, he was forwarding formal charges. And so um, I think it was a frustrating experience for everybody involved because uh, it seemed like as the two men were fine with each other and there was no personal dispute, that the issues that Dave was bringing to the table just weren't being addressed or being resolved in any way. What did you guys think about it? Did you think, oh, wow, this is going to be a problem? Or did you think, all right, somebody's saying something? Uh, I, I mean, at that time, where were you in kind of seeing that, yeah, there's something going on here with with uh, leadership? Hey, my, my thought was, uh, as, as that, as that um, continued, as that continued to be an issue and wasn't resolved uh, to Dave's satisfaction. My thinking was the only way that we could really move forward with a degree of integrity was to have a formal process and formal charges brought, which would either exonerate Mark or uh, come with some sort of correctional process to him. I, and we just couldn't leave that out there. That, that couldn't just go away. That wouldn't make, that wouldn't, that would not have integrity and that would not help anyone for that matter. And that's probably what morphed into Sutton putting together a more, uh, just a more specific plan to address those issues in Sutton. I don't know if you want to address that. Yeah, I mean, so I, I really didn't know Dave Kraft. He had gone down to California right around the same time that I came on the scene, which was in April of 2011. And so he, he, I really never had any, I really didn't get to know him at all. Um, but as I saw that thing unfold, I kind of compared it to Paul and Bent and, and that investigation and, and, and basically how, um, you know, I'd never met Paul or Bent because that happened in 2005 and 2006. But the, the, the great hurt 
that was in the culture from what happened with Paul and Vint. You know, fast forward to 2011, 2012, that, 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 that was still very real. And there were still a lot of people that were very, very upset. And so to me, I saw this as like with, with Kraft, same, same thing. Like th this isn't going to go away. That was the thing that I was thinking about was like Paul and Bent, that never went away. Like even today, there's some hurt that's around that. And so like Dave Kraft, especially him being an elder, like th this isn't going to go away. And, and I, I realized that there needed to be something formal put in place that was going to need to take place. And that's when literally started planning on some way of having the board of elders created, which later on, what was that? The, the early spring of 14 is when, when that got added to the bylaws. Okay. And so that the letter in a way was kind of a trigger for that being that process being added. Yes, definitely. Okay. Well, so personally, were you guys thinking, well, there's nothing to this uh, or, well, maybe there's something here in what he's saying. Uh, you know, where were you in the trajectory of, you know, because by now and, and by the end, you were thinking, yeah, there's some stuff here. But uh, were you anywhere on that train at that point or were you just trying to do your jobs? Yeah, see, yeah. I mean, there's something. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, you're insightful in asking that question. Where, yeah, I, I, you know, for a lot of the time that I was in Morris Hill, I, I did feel over my head, in over my head, uh, with, with, as our canvases were growing, as we were multiplying quickly, I, I felt really, um, yeah, I felt in over my head just to keep the thing moving and moving forward. Most of, uh, you know, we didn't see, I don't recall seeing the formal charges, and I don't know if you did at the time. I, I don't, I, I can't recall seeing them. The, the explanation we would get from Mark and others was that these were things that were largely in the past, that these were things mm -hmm. that had been corrected and addressed in the current and, and uh, as we can talk later, perhaps, I personally didn't witness many of the incidents that, that people would, would talk about from the past. So um, my thinking was that things had changed, that the market changed, that there was a progress being made on his part. But it also made me think that we did need to have a formal process so that we could assess that and we could evaluate that. I, I felt for Mark's, uh, for, for, for Mark's uh, future at Mars Hill, there had to be a reckoning. There had to be some formal sense in which these things were brought forth, where people had the freedom to express their concerns and, and, and a, to, to a group of people that would be unbiased and objective. And then we could move forward and then hopefully even not only move forward with whatever, whatever corrective action needed to happen, that we could actually move forward in true reconciliation, that people could be reconciled together. And so my hope was that would be a springboard. So, um, you know, I certainly had concerns um, it was, it was, I was still relatively new to the organization at the time, at least at that level. I didn't see the things that people mm -hmm. were hinting at and alluding to in the past going on in the present, um, in the same way. And so I thought maybe some progress was being made, but even the things they were bringing weren't beyond imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to I add agree. to that? So I'm just, just from mm -hmm. a standpoint of, Going back, so May 13, May of 2013, that there were so many things going on with the launching of those new campuses that when something like that would happen, um, uh, especially if I didn't know the people or was involved, I, I mean, typically would put my head down um, and had so much to do, um, would not, um, you know, and Mark said, you know, I'm dealing with this with Michael or whoever. And I would assume that it was, it was being handled. Um, which of course, you know, in hindsight was the wrong thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I should have been more involved. Um, I should have, um, uh, really read through and, and kind of like the situation that I have great heartburn about even through today that I didn't go back in my capacity and meet with Paul and Bent during that time period, Dave and I should have met with Kraft and we should have heard his side of it and we should have done our own research. I mean, we were executive elders. We were on the board. Like there's, we had 
you would think control or actually power or whatever you want to call it to do something. Um, but um, as you'll find out, you know, there was a lot of things that Dave and I didn't get a chance to participate in. Um, and so that was that craft is one of those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think that uh, that gives me some insight into your, your thinking at, at the time. Uh, and as things began to move pretty quickly uh, in the, toward the end of 2013, which leads me to uh, another event that, was th- that uh, brought the church into some notoriety uh, at uh, J- John MacArthur's Strange Fire Conference. It was uh, in October 2013. Uh, I believe both of you were with Mark and James McDonald uh, there at John MacArthur's Strange Fire Conference. Driscoll uh, just, hap- he said, just happened to show up uh, there uh, with his book uh, called Resurgence. That was, that's the title, right, of the, the book. And started handing them out to uh, conference goers. Uh, can you, uh, what's your recollection of that event? And uh, I got a few quotes from Driscoll. And after you tell me your recollection, I want to ask you what, you what you think of what he had to say. So what do you remember about all that? As I, as I think back, Warren, over all the things that I participated in at Mars Hill, that, that certainly is the most embarrassing to me. Um, mm. It was just disrespectful. It was disrespectful and it was, it was, it was, um, it was just wrong. And so we, we were in the area, we were down, I believe Sutton, if I recall correctly, we were in Long Beach where we were, we were going to participate yeah. in an act like men conference that was going to be held on a Friday, maybe Saturday or maybe a Saturday. And, and I think, uh, uh, I think Strange Fire was going on pr- just immediately prior to that. And so the initial, and so Mark already had the books with him. We were in town. He was going to be, I think, uh, the books were going to be available maybe at the Act Like Men conference. Uh, and so it started out that the concept started out with us going to a nearby Starbucks, uh, having books available, tweeting out, using social media to invite anybody who was going to the Strange Fire conference to come and pick up a free book, you know, maybe even signed by Mark in this space. And, and I think Mark, uh, you know, as I remember the conversations we had, his, his, his seemingly motivation was to provide an alternative to cessationism for a broader evangelical community. Like maybe there's this place between cessationism and the charismatic movement as it was at the time that was open to a continuation of the gifts. And I think that was the motivation. But as the plan unfolded, it just got weirder and weirder. So you know, it, it quickly went from let's go to a nearby coffee shop. Hey, let's drive on campus. Let's go out right during a break session in the main uh, place where all the participants would kind of spill out into. Let's hand out books. And and I, I uh, man, I have so many regrets over that. I didn't say anything. And I just, I just knew as we were doing it, it was wrong. I mean, I just knew in my heart it was wrong. And I felt that urge. Oh, I need to say something. I need to do something. And I was cowardly and didn't. And, I, and I, I don't know that I could have changed the course of action, but I think Mark would have listened. And so in that instance, not only did I uh, participate in something I'm really embarrassed about and was very wrong, I didn't serve Mark well either. You know, I, I just didn't speak up when I should have. And so what was going to be kind of a, 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 an opportunity to go alongside and provide, you know, an alternative for people who wanted to leave the conference to come to us quickly involved to us causing a ruckus at that conference itself. And it, it was really bad. Mm. Yeah, so um, I think to give you a little background and understanding the, how something like that happens. Um, so th- we were in uh, Long Beach for Act Like Men. Uh, we had brought down the lead pastor residents to have lunch with us. So we're sitting at a table uh, long table with all of, uh, for, with Mark, with uh, James McDonald, with all of our lead pastor residents, Dave and I. So, I mean, I don't know, 12, 14 people at this table, a long table. And the relationship between Mark and, and Dave was one of a big brother, little brother, being James being the big brother, Mark being the little brother. And James, uh, I typically, what I saw, this is my interpretation of the situation, um, there would be a, 
I dare you to do this, or I dare you to say this. And that would happen over and over again. Mm. Um, and knowing Mark, um, you dare him to do something and, and it's going to happen. Mm. Uh, especially when you dare him to do it in front of the lead pastor residents and a whole bunch of people, mm. not only is he going to do it, but he's going to take it one notch up. And that's what happened. Uh, we get in the car within, I can remember Dave. I mean, it was like f within 30 minutes, we're in the car after the dare books in the back. Um, uh, James is going to meet us there. So me and Dave and Mark are in one car and James is in another car um, coming there. Um, I mean, we're not close. I mean, this isn't like down the street. I mean, we're, we're driving all the way from where we were staying all the way over to uh, what is it, Sunnyvale or whatever the, the town is that um, Grace is in where Strange Fire Conference was. I can't remember the, 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 the town there in L.A. It's like 40 area. minutes, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a drive. Um, and Dave's right. You know, we were planning on going to the Starbucks or whatever, and then it quickly turned into we're in the parking lot. And not only are we in the parking lot, we're getting out and we're walking towards the you know, towards the breakout and it's outside. And I mean, and we're right in the middle of it. Um, and I got out, I mean, I, 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 just like Dave, I wish I could do that all over again. Gosh, that was so cowardly. And it was, uh, it was just horrible. I mean, it was just a horrible act. Um, but, um, I stood there with Mark the whole time, um, you know, and saw the whole thing um, happen and uh, wish we could go back and do that again. Yeah. Well, uh, Driscoll told the Christian Post, uh, he said, I wasn't planning on it. I just happened to be in town. Is that, is that right? I mean, the way you're telling it, it sounds like you just happened to drive 40 minutes uh, to the town. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how premeditated it was. It really did. And I think just on the background Sutton just shared, I don't, I didn't certainly go to Long Beach knowing that we were going to do this. It felt like a spontaneous action, but obviously there was 40 minutes to think it over and there were multiple steps along the way that we could have, we could have changed our mind. So right. I, I, yeah, I don't think, I mean, I don't believe that Mark intended to do that. And days in advance, months yeah. in advance. I, I do think it was kind of a spur of the moment thing. I, Sutton, I don't know if you would agree with that. I totally agree with that. It was a, a dare. Um, I'm just thankful because the next dare was that we were supposed to go drive by and find Rob Bell's house. Um, so I'm glad that that, that <laughs> never happened because uh, it could have gotten a lot worse. Um, but um, yeah, and, and, and I literally, I can close my eyes and see the security guard that was standing right next to us. And he was being so gracious. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, Hey guys, this, you know, can we take this somewhere else? Hey guys. I and mean, he was not, uh, I know that the word confiscated was used. It was not that it was more of uh, hand in the books to the, uh, the security guy saying here, if anybody else wants a book, you can give them out. I mean, it was not like confis. I mean, like, it was, right. And the guy was not adversarial. He was trying to be as nice, trying his best for there not to be any type of blow up or anything. I mean, he, the security guard actually handled it extremely well. Um, so, um, so anyway. Driscoll tweeted uh, that the security confiscated his books. That's where that word came from. Uh, and uh, the video shows, the, shows that uh, clearly what you just described. Uh, that that did not happen. All right. Well, that uh, that's a fascinating inside look at that. Uh, it, it certainly didn't ring true at the time, and and now so now we even know a little bit more of the the rest of that story. Uh, how did he uh, react later? Uh, he had kind of gotten caught in a deception there. He said he uh, that the security guard confiscated the books. Pretty much uh, the video showed that it didn't happen. Did he ever talk about it after the fact? I don't recall many conversations about it. What was confusing in the moment is what the security guard did explain to us, Warren, was there are many vendors that have paid to be at this conference sure. to, to right. distribute, and therefore 
it wasn't appropriate for us just to show up <laughs> unannounced right. And, right. and hand out free books. And so where the confusion was, I think in Mark's mind, was the security guards let us know like, hey, we, we can't let you do this. And then I believe one of the security guards, if not the primary security guard, offered to pick up the books and take them to Mark's car. And I think that's where confusion happened for Mark that are you confiscating these books? Because I think he even said, hey, if you're just going to go and throw them away, just give them to whoever wants them. And there's exactly a, there a disconnect there. Yep. Yeah, there's a disconnect there. However, we easily could have clarified that in hindsight and said, hey, you know what? They weren't confiscated. Um, the security guards took those books back. And I can't remember if they ended up sat in James' car or the car we were driving, but they... I, I'm confident Mark left with all the books that he brought other than the ones that he gave away in that time. And so, yes, th there could have been a clarification of that that would have put uh, the story to rest that we could have made. And I, I just, um, it just didn't happen. I can't recall why. I do remember us talking about that. And I don't, I don't know why it didn't happen, but it should have. Yeah, and then it moved, if you remember, um, quickly right after that, um, Mark, um, uh, gave an invitation to MacArthur to, mm -hmm. to come and be a part of our conference, uh, the resurgence conference. And so, so there was that escalating uh, type of activity that, that then took place. So, so really the next focus was not looking in the rear view mirror on saying, Hey, you know what, that, that wasn't, it was more of the next thing kind of going on the attack and saying, Hey, come, you know, come have a sit down with me uh, at the resurgence conference. Um, so, and that's where things turned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then not long after that, uh, Mark uh, went on Janet Mefford's show. This was now uh, Janet Mefford, the radio host. Uh, she wanted to talk about the book, the same book called A Resurgence. And uh, that didn't go so well. Uh, that was November 21st of 2013. And uh, she asked him about uh, the Strange Fire Conference, first of all, in that uh, interview. And then eventually accused him of plagiarizing some material from Peter Jones. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to probably, as a part of... Um, of uh, publishing our interview here, I'm going to include a little bit of that. I don't have it available now, uh, but I'm going to include a little bit of that uh, interview. But uh, that was a pivotal point for uh, some publicity concerning uh, Mark and the church and that book and plagiarism in general. Uh, he uh, seemed to hang up. I don't know uh, what you're on your end, if if uh, he did indeed hang up or there was a connection lost, but he appeared to hang up during uh, the interview. What was his uh, reaction to that interview as far as you, you guys know after the fact? Did he discuss any of that with you? And then more broadly, uh, how did he handle all those allegations of plagiarism that came uh, pretty fast and furious after that interview? Yeah, so my recollection of that, right after that happened um, was a, and this is, there's a, you're, you'll see a pattern of behavior here um, happened with Kraft, uh, happened with John MacArthur, happened with Medford, hap anyone um, happened years before with Rob Smith, um, anyone that uh, um, kind of comes in conflict with Mark, um, he's going to, double down and come back after them. And so that's, he was really mad. Um, and, uh, at that whole situation, um, and, and from my understanding had no idea, um, of the plagiarism that was in the book or any of that. Um, he was in my, I think he was pretty shocked, um, at that point in time. Yeah. Um, but then again, he was very aggressive back. Um, uh, I remember, um, towards Medford, um, kind of the same situation, kind of same situation we just talked about, which with MacArthur kind of escalating that, um, and wanting to escalate with her. Um, and so, and, and, and uh, but that was, uh, 
and, and we can talk a lot about the whole process on on the plagiarism and how that would came to be but um but specifically about medford he was really really angry i remember uh, i believe sutton and i were in salem oregon when that happened we were exploring a partnership with corbin university great people there uh, what it would look like for us to provide some sort of, Seattle just didn't have something like Corbin, at least we didn't to our members. And so we were exploring educational opportunities remotely and what we could do in a partnership. And we got noticed that this interview had happened. And so when we got back to Seattle, I remember two things that, that Mark felt. One was he was really surprised. Um, I think he felt like he was going to enter into that interview and just talk about his book, The Resurgence. Um, and so I think he was really surprised by uh, Janet Mefford's uh, aggressive stance and pushing on, hey, the, the, the plagiarism issue. And then the other thing I remember, Warren, is he was really saddened uh, as, as Peter Jones was a friend. And I think he was saddened that maybe, uh, he's saddened, maybe surprised that Peter hadn't reached out to him directly to express any concerns he had over the issue. And so I, I do remember there being kind of mixed feelings about it, but that definitely put us into a series of events that, that we just never recovered from as far as being able to gain uh, momentum and credibility among, among, among the members of Marso and even fellow leaders. It just think things really began to steamroll in my recollection after that. Mm. Well, th that uh, did open a number of other books to scrutiny at that point. And that's kind of what brought me into it in a bigger way at that point. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, at this moment pausing to reflect that six years ago it would have been hard to imagine this, the, what we're seeing on this screen right now, that uh, you two and I would be sitting down to talk. Uh, because, I, you know, I got into it, and I'll just say to you that I got into it initially because I thought Janet Mefford was probably wrong. That was my first thought was that she's she's probably not right about it. He probably didn't do that. And then when I got into it, I thought, well, there's it's you know, it's more than credible what she's saying. Uh, and then I went into other books and found other citation problems and uh, something a term came up that I, I had really not, I don't know, thought much about before, and that was content management system that there was a content management system at Mars Hill that, that was blamed for some of the errors, maybe many of the errors. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The content management system where there was a, a, a lot of pressure internally to just put out lots of material with Mark's name on it. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Dave, you want to go first? You want me to? No, I, I please go ahead. Sutton would, okay. have, Sutton would have been more privy to all that information yeah. that went that happened. Yeah. So, um, really, if you kind of go back to to when I got involved with Mars Hill in in 2011, um, you know, I was a general manager, but I was in charge of a lot of different things. Then Jamie Munson left as executive pastor, and I have and I stepped into that role. Uh, in the in the late summer of 2011, at that point in time, Mark had previously signed a um, a speaker uh, type of events with Real Marriage, which we'd been re uh, planning on releasing uh, at Christmas time um, at the end of 2011. And um, so it was there was these these events um, uh, that were going to be um, um, advertised, marketed, all those types of things with Mars Hill staff. Um, Mars Hill, like literally the media and communications team uh, of Mars Hill was going to advertise these things and push these things through the social media. Um, and and uh, honestly, I mean, Dave can talk about this as well, but, you know, there was just a culture um, at Mars Hill of, of using the platform um, for your uh, career, your personal career, and also your your personal financial benefit. Um, so selling books, uh, honorariums for events, all of these different types of things. And, um, you know, 
I mean, I'm sure we're going to get into real marriage and, and the, and the, and the, and the result source, but, you know, I mean, that was just a part of that whole thing that the, you know, it's, it's, it's all about building that platform for each individual people. And there were, there were several people that had platforms. Obviously nobody is as big as Mark's. Um, there were um, on the writing part, um, docent, uh, docent, I can't remember the research, the name. Docent research. Yeah. Docent research was used heavily um, for not only Mark's uh, research for his speak uh, speaking or, or uh, sermon series, but also for these books. Um, there were contractors that were contracted to, to write, but Mark was the editor on all of that. Um, and, you know, um, and one of the things that, that happened at, with the Janet Medford and plagiarism is that um, the reason why I agree with Pastor Dave is it was the beginning of the end is because there were things that were wrong that were found out publicly to be wrong, but we never came out and were honest with our church or honest with the people, um, whether it be you writing the blog post or somebody else writing the blog post, but it was always spinning it. So this idea that, oh, it was a contact management system, that's just a big word that, you know, basically – there was a book published that used somebody else's <laughs> material in the book and right. it was wrong. And most people would qualify that as plagiarism. Most people called it plagiarism because you're using not your own original work. And that was, and then, so, so you use an excuse instead of saying, you know what? Yes, this was plagiarism. Um, this needs to be corrected. I'm very, very sorry. I mean, you know, it was not. And, and so I think that that was uh, for the critics of the church. When, when, when people saw that of us not being forthcoming and truthful um, and using excuses, I think it was kind of chum in the water that just brought more and more and more people to circulate around there. So like, wait, 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 something's not right here because they're not being honest and forthcoming. There's got to be something more. And of course there was. And so I think it just led and, and we just have one after the other, after the other of these types of situations that led to the downfall of Marzil. You know, just to, just to maybe uh, add one more piece to that. I can't recall a single time that Mark would ever say that he intentionally plagiarized. I think that was his, 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 uh, his stance throughout that this wasn't something I intentionally did in hopes that I could get away with it. I think that kind of content management system was kind of his explanation of, I don't know how this happened. It slipped through the cracks. We can do better, but it wasn't my intent to, um, to, 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 to try to get away with something here. I, I didn't sneakily try to slide in somebody else's work and make it my own. And so it, again, it put us in a weird place of trying to figure out how is this happening and what can we do to correct it? And then looking back, what do we need to do to address, you know, do we, do we need to re-release books? Do we need to, you know, with, with correct citation, do we need to, what, what can we do? And uh, in the midst of why we're trying to figure that out and work that through and remedy that, all these other things continue to happen. And it just feels like some, some issues were open-ended and left, left undone when it, when it all ultimately uh, came crashing down. I, I think there are two things and two things that really hooked me in that story. One is the, as you said, Sutton, the obvious, something's not right here. And the explanation doesn't, doesn't make sense. And you tell somebody like me an explanation that obviously doesn't make sense. And I'm, I'm all over it. I mean, that's going to get my attention. But then the other thing that really kind of brought me in was the explanation of a, quote, content management system as supposedly a valid explanation of how you creatively produce work. You know, I don't have a content management system. I write my own work. And so for the little people who write their own work, it, it really highlighted the, the gulf between celebrity pastors 
and their machines and the rest of us. I think that uh, maybe made, was one of the factors that made the Mars Hill story a huge story that captured a lot of people's attention is it's one of those big guys versus the little guys stories. And a lot of little guys thought, well, if that's how the, the rest live, uh, you know, why are we going to tithe to that? And I, I heard a lot of that throughout 2014. And you guys felt that, right? Because donations started to dry up, uh, you know, throughout the year and things were not going well for you. Well, you mentioned uh, Sutton Result Source, and uh, I, uh, I have to tell you that was a story that, that a lot of people were chasing. Uh, Warren Smith eventually broke it uh, in World, I believe it was, and then the next day I came out with the contract. It had been leaked to me that uh, had been used between the church and Result Source. Uh, so and I know you've written about it some, Sutton. Could you guys, again, tell me what you know about that and just some of the, the understanding of what Result Source did for the Driscolls in that book, Real Marriage? Yeah. So let me, let's talk about what Result Source was. It was a company um, that you could hire as an author, and they would go around to the book stores in New York City um, and, um, they would actually, um, buy the books in these bookstores in New York city to then allow you, the person to be on the New York times bestseller list. So it was a contract to basically ensure that the book is going to make the New York times bestseller list. Um, so I arrived in April of 2011, um, I became uh, uh, over the media and communications team, um, even though book writing was kind of reporting directly to, to Mark. Um, and, um, and I reported at that time to Jamie Munson, who was the executive pastor that I then um, replaced after Jamie left. Um, the, the person that was head of um, the, the book um, writing and uh, real marriage came to me uh, I was not uh, his supervisor, but he came to me saying, hey, uh, you're the finance guy because that's part of what I had underneath me was finance. And we're going to be, we're signing, uh, agreeing to this contract um, that's going to cost the church a lot of money. Not only it costs the church a lot of money to pay them, uh, uh, pay Result Source to buy these books in New York City, but you're buying these books at full retail price. Um, whereas if you're a church, most of the time, uh, if you're, you have a celebrity pastor and he writes a book, you're able to buy those uh, at wholesale or, or you know, where there's no, basically there's no royalty involved and there's no markup involved. And so the church is able to buy them at the low level mark them up to what people are buying them in Barnes and Nobles and the church is able to make some money. Actually, in this situation, the church is, or the church not only is, is paying for result source, the contract, but the church is actually paying uh, and buying these books at full retail. And, um, and I think if I remember correctly, it was like 10,000 books. So, I mean, we're not talking a small, amount of money here. Right, uh, right. If, if you include not just the check that you paid to result source, but buying of all these books. Um, and so I brought it to Jamie's attention saying, man, th this, this is totally not above board. Um, and um, this guy has this well, and he did, he had all of the well documented. And I, I used that information that I was supplied to, to make my case because I had one-on-one -on -one meetings with Jamie. So nothing really happened for, I'd probably say four, five, six weeks. I'd ask about it. And then the next thing I know, um, Jamie um, uh, quickly resigned. Um, and so, and then I don't really have, I had met Mark like one time prior to that. Um, so I really didn't 
have any real interactions with those book decisions and those types of decisions. Was not a board member at that time or anything like that. And then we fast forward. Um, obviously that contract and that agreement was made. And then I remember the day specifically because it was like, it was, it was, it was in October um, when the, when the result source and all the plans and all the marketing and all these plans are already in place and up and running. And there, I get an email saying, Oh, by the way, we've never gotten a signature on the result source agreement. And I'm like, and I, I, that's when I remember it's either I texted Dave or I emailed Dave and I was like, this is, insert bad word here. This is freaking wrong that I'm the one that's got to end up signing this freaking thing. And I didn't, I, I was the one that was fighting to try to stop it. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I had a really a difficult time making that decision to sign that because I disagreed with it. And I remember talking to my wife about it and I was like, we either quit and this type of behavior continues to go on or we stay and we try to change and make some changes here. And, and that's when I'm, I knew like this board situation that currently exists. And it wasn't really in hindsight, it wasn't just the board. It wasn't the board members. It was just the lack of accountability whatsoever um, that was, that was involved there. Um, and, and, and I'm, I made the decision to stay. I signed it. Um, and, um, and I tried to do my best to change the board that next spring, which was the spring of 12, when we had the new bylaws that were put in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my recollection is that, uh, and this was this is going to be perhaps revealing of just kind of how we did business and at that time. Um, I had one conversation with the, another executive elder. It's, it was Jamie that, that, that Sutton was referring to. I remember specifically, we were driving across the 528 bridge over there in, in Lake Washington, I think to go to Bellevue and look at what was going on there. And, and Jamie just said, uh, hey, you know, there's an opportunity we have with Mark's next book to, to, to see that it gets on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, what do you think about that? And I said, is it legitimate? Does it have, you know, is, is, it, is it have integrity? And he said, yeah. And, and, I, and I trusted him. And, and I said, okay. And just moved ahead. And, and that is not an excuse, Warren. That is that is a dereliction of responsibility on my part, and I, I really blew it. Uh, that was the only conversation I ever recall the executive elders having about that book. Sutton, I know, went back and looked at minutes and, and meetings that we'd had. I don't recall ever a time that the, the, the three of us sat down and approved the contract. I don't remember a single time where Mark wasn't pushing it. I, I, I don't recall Mark ever sitting in a meeting and saying, hey, we really need to do this. Any interaction we had, I think, or, or particularly Jamie may have had, or even Sutton may have had, would have been through his literary agent at the time. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I'm really sorry. I blew it in that. I should have asked questions. I would like to believe, had I really known and pressed into it the way I should have, that I would have said, let's not do this. This is bad stewardship. This is lacking in integrity. Uh, this isn't the right way to go about things. But that's easy to say in hindsight. When I did learn, more of the details through conversations with Sutton later and uh, the person he's referring to that brought a lot of the incremental costs and things to, to his attention, to my attention of how it was, it was not right. I, uh, I asked him what was going to happen next. And, and uh, I was told that Mark was going to pay everything back, that he was going to pay back all the incremental costs that Mars Hill church incurred to do it. And then I would check in regularly with our finance people just to make sure that happened. And I was assured that that did happen, that, that he did in fact reimburse the church for those differential costs. And again, I don't know if Sutton can speak to that, but that was, I wanted to make sure that it was made right. It was remedied. And then in, in, in time, obviously um, it became more public as, as our, as our BOAA began to look into it, as things became public, it became very clear that this was wrong. We needed to own that. Uh, I know Mark removed New York Times bestseller list mm-hmm. from his bio online, and right. it was it was dealt with more publicly. Uh, it it was too bad, and it was a broader pattern at Mars Hill that things like this seemingly never came initiated by Mars Hill. They were always reactive and responsive to um, things that, that that Warren Smith wrote, things that you brought to our attention. That we just we just were always you know playing a game of 
how do we respond to this rather than I think just what would have built more credibility and been the right thing to do, just be transparent and say, hey, as we look back on this now, this is wrong. We should have done this. Here's what we're going to do to remedy it. Remedy it. And I think that would have at least given people in the church a little sense of credibility and integrity, but it just never happened. Yeah, I think yeah. The, uh, the, what, what tended to happen was there would be a denial or a statement from the public relations department, and then somebody within the church would leak something to me. And, for instance, a memo came out, uh, you know, saying that there or a memo from someone in the content management department saying that uh, the church shouldn't do the result source because it would reflect badly on the church and it was unethical and it would cost the church, you know, money and it would actually benefit Mark more than the church. I can I remember that memo and publishing that after um, your PR fellow came out and said, oh, it was, it was a great thing. Uh, there were yeah, three different things. stories. Yeah, two things on that, Warren. When I, so I wasn't on the board until um, late 2011. Um, and so one of the first things I did was to go back and look through the board minutes, um, of really, uh, July, August and September of 2011 to see if it was approved and how it was approved and all that kind of stuff. I found nothing. I found nothing. There was never a vote. There was never, it was never even discussed, um, in, in any of the board, whether it be the board minutes or the actual notes that people took that were attending the meeting. Um, so that was the first thing, um, which to me was like, man, how could this happen? And then never even discussed by leadership. And then the second thing, which Dave asked me in 2012, when all this stuff comes up, he said, you got to make sure Sutton that, that, you know, we make this right financially uh, because we bought all these books. Mark made a royalty on those books. Um, and we need, and so, so in December of 2012, so one year after I signed that, I made sure before we closed our books, uh, in 2012 to make sure, and that wasn't a popular thing for me to make sure. Um, uh, but it, but we did. Um, and, uh, because I told Dave that I would, I would make sure that that happened. And, 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 and to me, that was kind of the, the start of, Dave and I like trying to do some things that were kind of the public, like you you were never going to see that during that time period. We could never come out and say, yeah, Mark cut the check to, to offset the, the money that he made in that. But it was more of the like behind the scenes, like, okay, that was the right thing to do. Even though in the public, we're not, that, that was the right thing to do, which, um, which I thought kind of build trust between he and I during that time period. Why, why wouldn't it have been good for Driscoll to say, I repaid the church? No, there was never that I remember um, many uh, occasions to where it wasn't spun. So a mistake, whether it be plagiarism with Janet Mitford or whether it be results source, we called it a marketing scheme, Right. Um, you know, I mean, all of those things were spun. Plagiarism was, well, it was our content management. Team. So it was always, there was always somebody else that needed to take the blame for that happening versus uh, somebody standing up and saying, hey, I was wrong. This was wrong. It, it, it just never was the case. Uh, that, Like literally, over and over and over again, um, that was the cycle of Mars Hill. And I think if I, previous to me and Dave, that was the cycle of the church um, and the response for the church, that it was never, they were pretty much a victim. The church was a victim of something else that they would have never have done that, even though behind the scenes, um, that's, that's not true. I mean, behind the scenes, it was clear the reason why they did New uh, result source was to be the New York Times bestseller. I mean, that clearly pay this money and this will happen. Um, and so, but to say it was a marketing scheme is to try to nuance it um, in the end or to say in which 
we, we said at the time, well, so David Jeremiah and these other people, prominent people had done it before us. So therefore it makes it right. Yeah. Yeah. It w- was, was there a belief that internally that Mark was the brand? So was it, was it that kind of a pervasive belief that you could convince enough people that the, that the scheme was, I mean, you, you know, you've already said, you have said that you see now that it was wrong. You saw then that it, that it was not a, an ethical approach. But there were other people, too, around and, and that may have known about it. And there were people bringing it to you that thought it was just fine. Uh, was it the focus on Mark being the brand? And I'm, I'm going now, maybe you want to even say something about that speech, the I am the brand speech. Was, was there that kind of belief that if we could advance Mark and get him on the bestseller list, it'll somehow be good for the church? Yes. Yes. hundred um, percent. That, that, that it was going to fill the churches up um, and it would increase the, the size of the platform of Marcel. Yes. hundred percent. And I think even, even within that, within that, Warren, one of the things that if you weren't a part of Mars Hill, you, you wouldn't know offhand is there were just uh, so many conversions happening, you know, in the midst of all the, the, the broken things and the, the, there were people were legitimately meeting Jesus. And so those things kind of all got lumped together that if we can expand Mark's platform and give him a broader platform and he can utilize that platform to preach the gospel more people will get saved, more churches will get planted. And, and those two strategies begin to become aligned in ways. So I think a lot of people um, weren't thinking about just making a celebrity out of Mark. I think a lot of people at all different levels of the church were thinking, let's, let's see if we can reach as many people as we can. Let's see if we can plant as many churches as possible. And so it, it just, again, those two things really became intertwined in time. Well, that was some of the rationale, I think, uh, when the, the first story, you know, one of the first stories about why Result Source had had to do with expanding the, the brand, so to speak, or expanding the platform. But uh, when you say, I am the brand in a, in a Christian church, man, that, that uh, has some potential to, uh, to sound, you know, a little self-centered, doesn't it? Yeah, so what you're referring to was a, a media and communication we call a medcom. Um, I don't know, 30, 35 people plus all the other people that were there in um, the 50th building there in Ballard where we all main office basically. Um, and um, Mark, it was, uh, if I can remember right, um, there was – what I feel like some struggle um, between Mark and some people on the media and communication team um, with uh, what, what, uh, what's bringing people basically uh, what's uh, selling books, what's doing all these things. And um, Mark did make that comment um, in, in his, um, what would you call it? It wasn't a speech. It was more of a communication, like a, like a, like a staff meeting kind of feel uh, to it. Um, and definitely said um, that he was the brand. Um, and um, it, it was kind of a, if I feel like it was a get in line type of uh, speech from Mark um, to the media and communication. Of course, media and communication were working on a lot of different projects, not just Mark stuff. They were doing, whether it be uh, uh, the curriculum um, the and the Bible studies that were involved, it, it, a ton of stuff was done on re, uh, resurgence and some of the information that was being produced there. There's so much material that was being produced for the lead pastors. And so, Yes, even that was the most pol, uh, uh, popular that people saw was what Mark was working on. But and so it was kind of everything needs to get in line behind uh, what Mark was doing um, and singular focus around that. And so that was that speech. All right. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I remember that meeting, Warren. It was it was at Sun was it it was at the it was at the Ballard Church in that auxiliary room. And uh, oh yeah, specifically right. what I what Walked I recall, Mark. Yeah, I recall what Mark said is, you know, that the branding image is him holding a Bible, preaching preaching the word. What was really the the branding of the church, and and probably the reason that began to be to be needed to be said, or he felt it needed to be said, was there was a there's a real cultural shift happening. Um, with just just the philosophy of what we were doing, Warren, there there is a you know what what Marcel was known for up until that time was just faithful work through Bible books of the Bible, one you know expositionally one at a time. And so, among our creative team, there were guys who were raising the the question of this is different. We've we've never had somebody, particularly Mark, stand up and preach from a book he wrote. It's always been him in the pulpit preaching the Bible, and we kind of let that stand for itself. And so it really began, and this was the other part of it that a lot of people didn't see, it really began a rift in culture and, and what was going on in the midst of all these things that people were reading about online. What people were seeing was they began to see uh, staff departing really in mass, and it wasn't going well. And so in the midst of seeing kind of the public stories regarding Mark, uh, if you're at a local church, you're watching your your lead pastor leave, and it's not going great. You're watching staff that you've grown close to uh, begin to be uh, disenfranchised from leadership in the church, and all of these things were just kind of creating a a perfect storm that ultimately would lead to uh, the demise of Marcel. So credibility was continually being lost when you watch staff, you know, transition for whatever reason, and then you have this narrative in the background that Marcel lacks integrity and and uh, it's not being truthful about everything. So all this was culminating in just dark, dark storm clouds that mm. were about to burst. Yeah. And, and remember, right at this point in time is when Mars Hill music is, is really blowing up. Um, and there's a lot of notoriety around the country and people are starting to sing some of these songs that uh, these different Mars Hill church bands are, are putting out and it, they're becoming very popular. And so there's, there's, a, there's kind of a struggle uh, for resources, financial resources, but more importantly at Mars Hill, it was the, the, the people and what are they going to push through the platform of Mars Hill, whether it be social media, blogs, those types of things. And so there's Mark wanting his stuff to be pushed. The, 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 the Mars Hill music wanting their stuff to be pushed. And so it was really a struggle that was going on um, um, for, for that at that time. Okay. And so you, you feel like that he was kind of asserting his position in the middle of, of the growth of the, the church. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, back to results source a minute, uh, thinking about the, the role that that had in, in branding because uh, there was uh, the, not only the book, there was the, the seminars around the country, uh, j- just really a very, very well done marketing campaign, I have to say. Um, but it all hinged on the success of the book uh, and, you know, he acted surprised when it came out. Oh, look, it's a bestseller. Um, what do you think now, what would you advise, I guess, what do you think now a, a subordinate should do if a pastor, a lead pastor comes and says, I want to do something like this? You know, we want to grow our church by growing the brand. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have, uh, I think I have real strong feelings about that today, Warren. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I... I think if you're in a position where you really feel that your integrity is going to be compromised in, in decisions that are made, then the first step is to, to respectfully and use the right channels to protest. And I think I would tell anybody today, and if that isn't met with some sort of openness towards doing the right thing, then I'd walk away. I just, I, I think that the thought that somehow, some way I can be an agent of change although maybe is nobly motivated is just um, is short-sighted once you've once you've made your made your point and, and if it's not received and I really do think your your integrity and your conviction and your conscience is so much more important 
even if it means there's going to be financial hardship and uh, maybe even ministry closed doors in the future, I would just, you know, strongly encourage. And again, that's, that's me looking back. Obviously I didn't do that. And, and, and honestly, I regret that, but that's, those are my thoughts. Uh, yeah. So I, I saw um, a lot of people, for example, the guy that brought me the information on results source that tried to lead that change. Um, and, and he, qu- he left um, um, uh, like a lot of people left. Um, um, some people would stand up and say, Hey, this is wrong and write a letter or uh, want a request a meeting or something like that. Um, but there wasn't any change that was, or, or any recept, receptivity to, to, to hearing uh, how things needed to change. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think um, even though it led to um, the ultimate um, closure of Mars Hill as an entity, um, I think some of the things that we did on bylaw changes and putting basically forcing some type of uh, accountability around the situation was probably the only way that that was going to end. Um, and the, the pattern was going to change. Um, that being the case, if I were to tell an executive pastor today that was in my position and they had the same situation, I, I would tell them they need to go to whatever authority and you would hope that there would be some type of authority structure, godly authority structure that would be over a church and to um, humbly up, appeal to them um, of the situation and try to be the, to me, that's the only thing to way to make change in, in these uh, mega church type of structures um, is to hope that there is some type of board or some type of authority structure that's in place that really loves the local church, that's trying to do what's best for the local church, and that even, you know, and that want, will exert their authority um, on the leader to make changes that need to be made. And so that that would be what I would tell the new that the person that would be facing what, what Dave and I were facing back when 2011, 12 and 13. All right. 